The British Rail Class 58. What, immediately? Why are you here? Why are you always here? What is the matter with you? Why must you insert yourself into everything I do? I'm not even British. I'm an American. Is this some kind of payback for the whole revolution thing? You know what? I wasn't even alive then. You can't do this to me. <sighs> the Class 58, which is nicknamed The Bone by rail enthusiasts, was a diesel-electric locomotive that was manufactured by the British Rail Engineering Limited, as well as Doncaster Works, between 1983 and 1987. They only produced 50 of them, and from the get-go, they do look kind of funny. The cabs themselves are fairly standard as far as British diesels go, but what's with that midsection? Why is it so square? It looks like there's a bunch of little doors, and that's by design. You see, the Class 58 was almost an experiment, incorporating an American practice, and you're welcome by the way, of modularization. Effectively, the Class 58 is just the British take on a hood unit, where maintenance is made incredibly easy by making every system possible on board the locomotive modular, able to be taken out and replaced entirely, and it was honestly very good. The Class 58 was pretty good at what it did, with the only issue found was that climate control systems in the cab weren't effective when the locomotive was going at high speeds, but this was quickly rectified and there were no other main issues. And in fact, crews loved it. The maintenance techs adored them because they were easy to work with, and their cabs actually set the standard for a lot of future diesel designs because they were so comfortable and easy to work with for the drivers. So why are they no longer in service, I bet you're wondering? Well, that's due to a few factors. One factor involved a miners' strike. They were meant to pull coal trains, and the miners decided to pull a strike, so they couldn't do that. The British Rail had to redesignate them on basically every freight train they possibly could. Additionally, British Rail was accused of ordering too many of them because their parts to construct them were already on order anyway, which meant they had too many of the units for the amount of work they actually needed. Additionally, when privatization happened, the 58s came under the ownership of the English, Welsh, and Scottish Railway, or EWS, now known as DB Cargo UK. And for whatever reason, they just didn't like them? Like, at all? They wound up withdrawing them in 2002, after only 19 years of service. Some of them were scrapped, five are currently in preservation, however, 36 wound up being exported to France and Spain. And some believe that EWS's decision to export the class was an incredible waste, because these weren't bad locomotives at all. They did their jobs quite well. And apparently the UK suffered a shortage of available locomotives in the mid-2010s, and had these not been exported, they could have helped alleviate some of those problems. But, you know, corporate mismanagement ruins all nice things, as we all are well aware of. And why the heck did British Rail find its way on a weird list? Most of your diesels are pretty normal. This is like, the one. It's a bit odd. And it's good! You just ordered it when you didn't need that many. And then you got privatized. And then the EWS is like, no, we don't want those. And then they actually needed them. And you can't get them back now. Like, what? I don't know what's going on over here. Like, like, like guys, UK, my audience, are, are you all right? We're like, I'm just checking. Are you guys okay? Like, really? I, I just want to know. Blink once for yes, blink twice for no. Coffee pot locomotives. Okay, what in the heck is that thing? This is an excellent question. Manufactured in 1871 by Head Wrightson for the Dorking Greystone Lime Company, this is a, well, it's basically a tank engine, but they were called coffee pots because, well, look at them. Though to be honest, the design isn't that weird. I mean, it does look odd compared to what we think of when we think of a steam locomotive, but it's not that far off from our first steam locomotive here in America, the Tom Thumb. What about you're wondering, how was this itty bitty thing successful? I mean, it's so tiny. And yeah, it's small, sure, but that doesn't mean it wasn't good at what it did. It was efficient, and it was only ever meant to work at the Betchworth Quarry, pulling small trains with small loads at low speeds. And for that purpose, it was exceptional. And not being super complicated to operate, because the quarry workers were quarry workers. They were miners. They were trained to mine stuff. Their training wouldn't have encompassed steam locomotive operation. So it had to be as simple as possible, so pretty much anybody could have used it with a basic overview. While there were a handful of coffee pots, number one, specifically put in a lot of work. Remember, it was manufactured in 1871. It was not withdrawn until 1952. Over 80 years this little coffee pot was trucking around. And in 1960, it was in derelict condition when it was purchased by Head Wrightson. It was moved to Thornaby, where it joined number 21 and number 33. And they actually wound up restoring number one to some level of operation though initially it only ran on compressed air. 
In 2006, a major restoration project was started to restore the locomotive's esteem, which it finally did again in 2010. It's currently operational at the Beamish Museum, which is pretty impressive for such a little guy, don't you think? The Stussbach. Okay, what the heck is that? Um, I don't even know where to begin. In fact, you wouldn't even recognize that as a type of train if uh, I hadn't told you it was, because it is. But, um, well, what's, what's going on here? Okay, I'll explain. The Stussbahn, which is also known as the Schwiz Stuss Vernacular, or Stanzebahn Scheiß Stuss? Yes? Yes, did I hit it? Switzerland, confirm! Did I pronounce all that correctly? No, of course I didn't. The Stussbahn is a vernacular railway, which is a railway system that operates off of a system of cables, and they're pretty much always used to navigate steep slopes. The line is actually a total of 1.7 kilometers, or 1.1 miles, which is pretty long by vernacular standards, but this thing goes up a very steep slope. The maximum gradient here is 110%, or 47.7 degrees, and it's the steepest vernacular railway in Switzerland, and Europe for that matter. Some people consider it the steepest in the world, but technically speaking, the Katoomba Scenic Railway in Australia is steeper, with a maximum gradient of 122%, but it uses a winch system. And so, technically speaking, it would be an incline lift and not a vernacular railway, which would mean that Stutzbahn is the steepest vernacular, technically. Argue about that in the comments. I'm not gonna get into that, but man, does this look funny. I mean, vernaculars are usually, you know, box-shaped, you know, go up and down, but this one was designed in an admittedly very creative way. Because you're probably wondering why the carriages on this thing, those little round bits, are, well, round. Why does it look like that? And no, it's not just a stylistic choice. See, as the suit spawn goes up the gradient, the round carriages actually rotate on their own due to gravity. Most of their weight is in their floors, so because of the gravitational pull, they'll always rotate towards the Earth and therefore always maintain a level surface regardless of how steep of a gradient the stew spawn is going up. It's simple, but elegant, and actually quite ingenious. I love the idea. This is a fairly recent weird train. It only opened in 2017, but I kind of look forward to seeing others duplicate the design because I find the idea quite appealing myself. And speaking of Switzerland, the Swiss Federal Railways Class E 3-3 Electric Steam Modification. Okay, what the heck is going on here? That is a tank engine, and that is a pantograph, and those are electric lines. Why? What? Huh? I don't... Huh? Very rarely has electricity and steam power mixed, because when you think about it, it actually makes zero sense. If you're in a position where you can't make steam power from coal or wood or something else, and you have to use electricity, well, why not just make it an electric locomotive by default? You're adding a bunch of other steps and overcomplicating things. Electric locomotives can be just as powerful as steam locomotives. It's possible. So on the surface, there's really no benefit here, except for a unique situation that Switzerland found themselves in during the Second World War. See, when the war broke out, Switzerland did what they always do and remained neutral. And they actually got most of their coal from Germany. Switzerland has no natural reserves of coal, so they had to. But as the war dragged on, the price of importing German coal kept rising. For reasons I don't think I need to explain, but the answer is they were losing and needed the coal for themselves. Switzerland was also in a position where they couldn't actually manufacture any new electric locomotives. Though they had some, they needed more rolling stock, and they had a bunch of steam engines kicking around, but with the coal prices as high as they were, it was impossible to make them efficient, unless... They utilized the fact that they just had a ton of pantograph lines around and modified two tank engines, both class E3-3s, 8521 and 8522, with pantographs. Through some clever design work, they could use the electricity to actually heat the steam boilers. This meant that the engines didn't actually need to use coal at all, although they did retain their fireboxes as an extra heat source just in case. Additionally, once they built up full pressure, they could actually operate without the pantograph lines, therefore no heat source, for about 20 minutes, which would have been long enough for some light shunting duties. They were incredibly useful modifications, but only because of the unique situation that Switzerland was stuck in at the time. Once the war ended and Switzerland regained access to cheap coal, the electric heaters were removed, 1951 for 8521 and 1953 for 8522. 
As of 2013, 8522 is still in museum service. On the Circe Triangan Railway, as an ordinary steam locomotive, no electric heater attached. The Shea. Oh, I'm so excited! Shays are actually one of my favorite locomotive types, but let's be fair, if you've never seen one before, they look incredibly bizarre. Like, what is going on here? The pistons are going up and down, and there's the, the side spinny thing, and the what? I don't... where are we... what is this thing? Okay, backstory. Ephraim Shea was the inventor of the Shea locomotive, as the name might imply. The Shays were designed to fill a very specific niche in terms of rolling stock technology. What you are looking at is a type of geared steam locomotive. Geared locomotives are different from regular steam locomotives in that their power output does not go to their wheels directly. Instead, it goes through a gearing system, the layout of which varies between types. There's Heislers, there's Climaxes, there's a few others, but the Shays are arguably the most successful version of this particular design ethos. But why would you want to do that? Well, that's because the Shea was meant for logging, mining, and other small industrial operations that took low speed but high tractive effort. The one thing pretty much all geared steam locomotives have in common is they're usually pretty slow. Their top speed might reach 30 miles per hour, maybe. But that's irrelevant because they were never meant to go very fast. Because to make up for their lack of speed, their tractive effort, their ability to pull heavy things, is ludicrous. Shays were capable of pulling an insane amount of weight for their size. There were several different versions of the Shea, Class A, Class B, Class C, and Class D. The Class A's only had two cylinders, but from B and beyond, they were given three cylinders, and Class C and Class D each added an additional truck to them to make it easier for them to go around corners. Because that was the other thing about Shays, that they were designed for mining operations, particularly in the mountains. For one thing, they could pull a tremendous amount of weight, yes, but they could also do it upgrades that regular steam locomotives would never have tolerated. They could handle grades of up to 6%, and consider for a moment that for a normal steam locomotive, a 3% grade is considered very steep. 6% is double that, and the Shays could handle that with heavy loads behind them. They were also very heavy, but remarkably stable. This was helpful because often the rails they ran on weren't laid by professional track layers. They were laid by miners or woodcutters, and those guys just weren't trained in track laying, so the lines tended to be a little shaky. But the Shays were able to go over rough lines, and in the event they did derail, they were actually pretty easy to put back on the tracks, making these locomotives a godsend for rural operations of a wide variety. They were exported to a handful of countries, but they really are best known for their work in North America. They also saw an insane amount of preservation, probably down to how unique they were and also how successful. 115 Shays survived into preservation, and they're located in various places, and a handful are actually still in service in Indonesia, believe it or not. The best place I've ever been to see these locomotives is the Cass Scenic Railroad located in Cass, West Virginia. All their rolling stock are actually geared locomotives. They have a Heisler and a Climax, but they have quite a number of Shays, including the largest Shay ever built, and the last one built, Number 6, who is a big girl at 162 short tons. I've been down there myself, and I personally vouch for the railroad's quality. It's quite a nice ride through the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia, and I'd recommend it for any rail enthusiast. Especially if you've never seen a Shea before. They're peculiar, but phenomenal pieces of design. The Santa Fe CF-7. Well, that's the shortest hood unit I've ever seen in my life. It kind of looks like if you took an EMD SD-40 and just like squished it together. And to be fair, the CF-7 is technically an EMD, but it was not in this form originally. They're switchers and successful ones, but these were rebuilt by the Santa Fe Railway between 1970 and 1978. What were they originally? Well, that's the weird part. These are F units, arguably one of the most iconic American diesels ever. But why would they turn the glorious F units into tiny squished switchers? Well, that's because Santa Fe needed switchers. They didn't want to necessarily invest in new ones, and they were wondering if it'd be cheaper to remodel their old F units into hood units. Because the F7s were dated, but they still were powerful enough to do switch work, the problem was their car bodies. And car bodies are awful for switching. Because of the job's nature, they have to be able to go backwards and forwards. Now, car bodies can go in reverse, but it's almost impossible to see when those diesels are going backwards. 
Fluid units are much better for this, but like I said, Santa Fe didn't want to actually have to buy any new ones when they had perfectly serviceable F units kicking around, so they remodeled them with new custom-made bodies and called them the CF-7s. And they were great! Absolutely exceptional! Not only did they give the original F units a new lease on life, allowing them to live long past the point that they would have been retired, the CF-7s also outlasted themselves. A handful are in preservation, and Santa Fe sold them to quite a number of different places all across North America, including Amtrak. As of 2017, there are still a number still in service to this day. In various forms, they've been in service over 60 years. Quite an impressive achievement for a diesel that looks like it got thrown into a hydraulic press. The British Rail Class 13. British Rail! Would you please just leave me alone? I don't want to talk about you anymore! You just have so many locomotives, and they fit into so many lists! It's like impossible to dance around you! I have to talk about you, and I don't wanna! I don't wanna do it! But I have no choice. It's my curse. Darkness the curse. Anyway, British Rail Class 13 may look like two separate locomotives, and honestly, they sort of are. They were designed in 1965 because they needed more powerful shunters for the Tinsley Marshalling Yard. The thing was, the Tinsley Yard was a hump yard. A hump yard uses, well, a hump on the lines to shunt cars into positions. Instead of forcing the locomotives to go all the way down to each siding and then all the way back up, they simply put the cars on the hill, uncouple them, and allow them to coast down into the trains that they're supposed to be in. It's actually a pretty clever system and used in many different countries, but they were worried the 08s as they were might get stuck on the hump. So to prevent this, they came up with a solution. And it was one of the most dirt simple solutions I've ever seen, but it did work. They permanently coupled two 08s together in a master and slave configuration, and even removed the slave's cab entirely. As a result, the power output was doubled, because there were two locomotives. And it worked! They served the Tinsley Yards quite well, but they only ever made three of them, because they were built for a very specific yard in a very specific situation. The Tinsley Yards stopped hump shunting in the 80s, so the locomotives became unnecessary, and all three of them were withdrawn by 1985. None of them were preserved, but to be fair, it would be pretty easy to make one again. They are literally two Class 08s duct taped together. That is exactly what the Class 13 is. So even though the originals are gone, there's plenty of 08s still kicking around. You could make them again if you really wanted to. The Victorian Railways B Class. Well, why is this on the list? That's not weird at all. It looks pretty normal, actually. I mean, for a diesel built in the mid-20th century, anyway. Just looks like an F unit. What's so bizarre about- Oh, 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 oh. Okay, yeah, that's, um, that's a little odd. That's a little bit odd. Ordered and operated by the Victorian Railways in Australia, they actually initiated the dieselization of that system and were used for both passenger and freight services. If it wasn't obvious, they were based on the EMDF units. The major obvious difference is that they'd stuck a second cab on the rear end, both being streamlined with a distinctive bulldog nose. There are some other minor differences, mostly to reduce the axle load, as the EMD units by default were too heavy for the Victorian tracks. But when the first locomotive was delivered in 1952, they turned out to be exceptional. The addition of a second cab at the rear meant that they functioned much better than the default car body units because they could run well in both directions. You didn't need to worry about going in reverse, because I mean, there really wasn't a reverse, was there? It didn't matter which way the locomotive was going, it was always technically going forwards as far as it was concerned. The locomotives proved so successful that some are even still in service. And I'm not talking about preservation. I mean, there are three preserved, but I mean seriously, some are still working on the Victorian lines. A phenomenal display of usefulness by what looks like a bit of an oddball. Rack Railways, also known as Rack and Pinion Railways, or Cog Railways, or Cog Wheel Railways. There's a lot of different names for them. But basically, a Rack Railway is another way of doing a funicular... <clears throat> Uh, which I can't pronounce, as the last episode would have shown you. But it's not a funicular at all because there's no cables involved here. It is a steep grade railway that uses a toothed rack rail. This third rail that sits between the two normal ones is toothed, and the locomotives are equipped with a cog, or a gear. This cog fits into the gaps of the third rail, 
and allows the locomotives to handle steep grades above 10%. They were designed in the early 1800s, and there are still many versions of them kicking around. The first cog railway was the Middleton Railway between Middleton and Leeds in West Yorkshire, England, United Kingdom. Not content to have the first cog railway, this railway also had the first commercially successful team locomotive, the Salamanca, that ran in 1812. As funny as the cog railways may seem, they have their uses when it comes to steep grades. The Southern Pacific Class AC-12. Ah, the AC-12. The cab forward steam locomotives actually had a bunch of different models made for it, but the AC-12s are arguably the most famous, and definitely one of the largest. They entered service on October 27, 1943, and only 20 were ever produced, but they were actually pretty good. You may be wondering how the crew on board a steam engine is able to control, say, uh, the firebox, when the tender is in what we would normally call the front of the steam locomotive. Well, that's because the AC-12s, and many of the cab forwards actually, were oil-fired. They would still pull the tenders behind the locomotive, and the oil would be drawn up through pipes. That's about the only difference between the AC-12s and a conventional 2884 locomotive. And they were utilized all over Southern Pacific system, though they were probably most famous for working on Donner Pass and Cascade Summit. So that they were only utilized for about a decade, despite how good they were, but it had nothing to do with any fault with the locomotives. They were just curated, well, in the early 1940s, and they were retired in the mid-50s. That is because of a certain type of locomotive becoming much more popular and appearing to push steam out of existence on America's railways. Yes, diesels. Diesels came into being. The dieselization of America's railways killed off all the steam locomotives, pretty much, and the AC-12, weird or otherwise, was no exception. Why bother to modify steam locomotives in a weird way to make them cab forward when the new EMDs did that by default? When you look at it from that perspective, I kinda get it. Fortunately, one of the AC-12s, SP-4294, is actually still around as it was preserved and is now on display at the California State Railroad Museum. So at least this oddball is still able to be appreciated by rail fans all over the world. The Double Farley Locomotives why, what is that I spy? Are those two tank engines that have been glued together? Well, not completely. There's more to go into this than you think. This type of locomotive, which was patented by Robert Francis Farley in 1864, is actually one of the earliest articulated steam locomotives. It was actually constructed as a solution to try to maximize the weight on the driving wheels of the locomotive. The thing about the double Farleys is that all the wheels were driven. And they saw some use not just in North Wales, but in quite a few places around the world. Canada, Mexico, and even the US gave them a chance in 1872. We didn't like them so much because they weren't tender engines. And it's one of their biggest flaws. To be honest, I had to weigh putting the Double Farleys on the list like this, because to be realistic, they weren't the most successful things in the world. And that was due to a number of flaws. The biggest one is the lack of a tender. Even tank engines have a bunker behind them giving extra space to store coal or even extra water. The Farleys just couldn't do this because their cabs were linked. Their steam pipes were also flexible, which was interesting, but they were prone to leaking and wasting power. Their bogies also caused problems because even though the idea was to drive all the wheels forward, without leading and trailing wheels, that meant they were more prone to derailing, and they were known to be pretty rough riders. So why did I decide to include them on the list? Well, it's because they were revolutionary for their time, and inspired a lot of future developments with locomotive technology in general. Just the idea of having a double-ended locomotive was interesting. And while it wasn't very easy to do with steam technology, electric and diesel locomotives would go on to have this set up as the standard in many countries all over the world. So, here's one of the Double Farley, whose only major flaw I feel was being made before its time. The DB Class ETA 150, used exclusively by the Deutsche Bundesbahn for 40 years. These German rail buses don't look that weird on the surface, but when you realize how they operated, well, okay. You know how a lot of new, exciting techs come out and they're like, look, these are battery powered cars or even locomotives, and those are cutting edge built and designed to cut emissions and save the environment, even though lithium-ion batteries are actually horrible for the environment. We won't talk about that. Well, the 150s were put into service in 1955, and they were not diesels, nor were they electric in the traditional sense. 
They used direct current motors that ran off of old school batteries. Yes, really, these were battery powered rail buses constructed in the 50s. I don't know what I expected out of German technology, except this exact thing because y'all are out of control over in Germany, okay? Like I'm an American and I'm proud of what we've accomplished, but it feels like Germany in particular always has this precision engineering ethos behind them, where they come up with these insano ideas well before everybody else and no one gives them credit for it. Despite the fact that you'd think being battery powered in the 50s might be a hindrance, these rail buses were actually extraordinarily good. They rode extremely well, were pollution free when they were in operation because there was no smoke or fumes, and they were actually extremely quiet. They were only known to have a small buzzing noise due to the whine of their DC motors. Passengers adored them, and that's why they saw service for so long. Their big limitation was, of course, range. They were batteries, after all, and their routes were constrained to level terrain. They didn't want to send them in hilly lines because going uphill would, of course, result in higher power consumption and limit their range even more. But on short level routes, they were insanely useful and, frankly, kind of adorable. I'm not gonna lie. The M250 series. Sometimes branded as super rail cargo, these are freight EMUs which sounds really weird already, but bear with me on this. They were manufactured by Kawasaki Heavy Industries, and I'm pretty sure this is the first Japanese locomotive that's ever been included on any of these lists. They were constructed between 2002 and 2003, and they're still in service now. You've probably already noticed that they look a bit bizarre, and yes, they are, and that's why they're here. Like I said, they're EMU, so they're electric multiple units. The thought process with them was to sort of save space or rather maximize space. Instead of a big, bulky locomotive in the front, the control car also has a flat surface for cargo in itself. You can put a container on the unit. It's actually a genius setup, though admittedly the Japanese were not the ones that initially came up with it. That was the Germans again, actually. The cargo sprinter was designed by Windhoff in Germany in the mid-1990s. And they have a very similar design ethos. The difference in them is that they're diesels, and unfortunately weren't quite as successful as the M250s turned out to be. Either way though, the idea of maximizing cargo space on a train is a novel one, and both these designs deserve some credit in that department. Tunnel Hedgehogs. Well, that doesn't look super weird, except for that thing on the front of it. And I don't know what that would be for. It's like, got a bunch of spikes poking out. Why would it have that? Ah! Oh goodness, it's like a Dilophosaurus from Jurassic Park. Is it gonna spit venom in my eyes? Please don't. Uh, no, it won't do that. This is a Tunnel Hedgehog, and it's one of several locomotive units that was put together for a very, very specific purpose. Whenever a railroad is doing any kind of remodeling when it comes to their lines, like putting in electric pantographs, for example, tunnels are always an issue. They have to be able to measure the consistent distance in the tunnel to see how much room they actually have to work with. The hedgehogs were designed to be able to mechanically measure this, giving the engineers that were responsible for whatever maintenance or upgrades they were performing very critical data regarding how wide the tunnel really was in relation to the typical locomotive. On one hand, the tunnel hedgehogs aren't good for anything but doing that one thing, they were really good for that one thing. And the railways probably saved money in the long run getting exact measurements that they so desperately needed rather than relying on eyeballing it or possibly initiating a human error when attempting to measure it a different way. Still looks kind of weird though, freaky. So stop looking at me that way, it's like a threat display. I didn't steal the embryos, talk to Nedry. The Climax Locomotive. Ever since I talked about the Shea in the very first part of this particular series, I've been asked to discuss other geared steam locomotives, and I figured I'd go with the Climax this time because, well, next to the Shea, it looks the most bizarre. Its piston setup is upwards and at an angle. Two steam cylinders are attached to a transmission located under the center of the boiler. This transmits power to drive sheds running to the front and rear trucks. So it's still a geared setup, but it's different than a Shea. And even though the Shays definitely saw the most success overall when it comes to geared locomotive design, the Climaxes in practice are at least just as good, and some crews actually preferred them, as the smaller Climaxes were actually better than some of the smaller Shays at going around tight corners because the Shays didn't have springs on their bogies. 
climaxes did, and this made them much more easily able to compensate for twists on the lines. Not that shades were necessarily bad at that, but climaxes were a bit better in this specific instance. Despite that they did not see as much use, they weren't as popular, but at least 17 are still preserved in North America, and five of the total preserved locomotives are in operational condition. So despite dwelling in the shadow of the chaise, the climaxes still saw plenty of preservation in their own right, and I think they deserve some respect in their own regard. The NS Intercity Material. No, that's not misspelled, this is Dutch. Nederlandse Spoorwagen. And a special thank you to my Discord server for helping me put this list together. As I was a little busy this week and I didn't have time to read as much as I usually would, and I kinda needed some suggestions for some of my followers, and Lord knows the Dutch seized their opportunity. This is just one of three different Dutch trains on this list. But admittedly, they did give me weird ones, so I'll give them a pass this time. I just enjoy the fact that all I said was, I need weird successful locomotives, and they responded with, did you mean Dutch? I, I don't know what I expected from them. The Intercity Materiel is an electric multiple unit, an EMU, that was operated by Nederlandse Spoorwagen in the Netherlands. Its nickname is Koplopper because it had a walking through head mechanic that I'll get to. You might think that relates to the position of the cab, which in part, but not exactly. These things are double-ended for one. And the cabs were put high for at least two reasons. One that does give the driver a solid field of view. It looks bizarre, but they can sure see well out of them, so hey. But the real reason for the walking through head element is that these things were designed for multiple unit operation. You could combine multiple train sets together and have them work. But they were double-ended. How would you connect a cab to, oh. Well, that's neat. Yeah, so there was a walkway built underneath where the cab was, and there were doors on the front of them that allowed them to connect to each other that way. It was an interesting setup, if not quite weird. 144 of these were built in total, and they've been in service since 1977. Yes, they are indeed still used. They were quite successful. However, their weirdest element, the walking through head thing, yeah, that um, is no longer used at all. In fact, they were permanently sealed shut in 2006 during a refurbishment because they never really worked that well, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I'm kind of cheating here because like overall they are a success, but their weirdest element wasn't. For one thing, they just didn't have to use them that often, but they also were prone to a lot of technical difficulties. It actually made trains late on occasion, which was, well, annoying. They didn't want that to happen anymore. So they just said the heck with it and stopped using them entirely. Still, the train sets themselves are still in service now. And if you're ever in the Netherlands, you could, in fact, ride on them. Some of my Dutch rail fans who follow me probably have at some point. The NS Class 200. See, I told you the Dutch got a little carried away here. The Nederlandse Spoorwagen. Class 200 is a group of diesel locomotives that were built between 1934 and 1951. A total of 169 were produced, and the last of them weren't retired until 2008, which is actually legitimately impressive. But to be fair, they were designed to be as simple as possible, tiny little diesel shunters built by Verksvoer. The railway staff called them locomotors due to how small they were, but what's so weird about them? They look just like typical diesel shunters. Look closer. Look closer at the absolute nonsense on display. What is that? Are those controls? On the outside of the locomotive? Oh yes. They were meant specifically to be operated from the side. And they weren't even equipped with a dead man switch to stop the locomotive in case the operator like, well, fell off in this element, which is probably infinitely more likely. There were two manual brakes, a handle and a foot brake. The handle was in fact so loose that it could be moved by in-train forces, so it was required to be fixed by a nut and a bolt. It was necessary to loosen this nut and bolt whenever you took them out, and in some cases that was forgotten entirely, and that meant that the operator couldn't brake, which caused them to run into things often enough to be mildly irritating, but they did function very, very, very well and were extremely cheap to operate. Some were even fitted with cranes, which also had to be operated from outside, though at least there they would be used whenever the locomotive was stopped, so I kind of get that. 
Like I said, they lasted until 2008, which is really impressive. And the reason they were pulled was, frankly, due to safety reasons. New Dutch personnel regulations involving keeping people from dying prevented Niederlandse Svorwagen from using them any longer. If that hadn't been in place, they probably would have kept using them because they were just so easy to manage. They were as simple as can be to the point of making them downright bizarre, but they functioned well. But sadly, they are no longer used. Though over half of them actually survive in preservation, around 89 or so. 80 of them wound up scrapped or lost during the Second World War. But the rest are still around because, well, they're tiny. They're easy to put in places and useful on heritage rail lines. We always love these tiny diesels, so hey, more power to them, I suppose. The Saxon 3K, or just sometimes called the 3K, which I'm not going to do because of reasons. We're just gonna call it the Saxon 3. These were a group of six tank engines, 062Ts, that were originally built for the Royal Saxon State Railways. That's how far back these date. They were originally built in 1889. Royal Saxon State Railways were the state-owned railways operating in the Kingdom of Saxony. Later, the company would be merged into the Deutsche Reichsbahn, Germany. And these locomotives were grouped into their DRG Class 99.754s. Whatever you want to call them, what is the deal with that? That has no business operating. I don't know what it is. I don't trust it, though. Look at it. It's very suspicious. But it worked. You're probably wondering what's going on with that. And, uh, well, I'll answer this. These were very powerful tank engines for the time, and in that regard, they were extremely useful. They proved their worth, but their technology was inherently complicated, and that's why there were only ever six. The boiler itself was a long boiler type that was made from three rings that had to be riveted together. They had two cylinders between the frames with external Stevenson valve gears, which drove the middle coupled axle. The power transmission to the radially adjustable coupled axles was carried out using length adjustable coupling rods of the close type. Radial adjustment of the first and third coupling axles and the control of the lever parallelogram on the coupling rods was carried out according to the swing out radius of the articulated bunker using a lever linkage. Now why in the heck would you want to do any of that? Well, simply put, it helped them negotiate turns. The driving axles could change their distance to the middle axle to fit through tighter corners. In that way, it's almost an early method of articulation, however silly it may seem. But if it worked, it worked. And it did. They were quite successful. Just too complicated to reproduce is kind of what their case was. But they lasted until 1925. So that's about 35 years of actual service, which is not bad for such a really weird case such as this. The LTM-51. Yeah, see, I warned you there were three Dutch trains on here, and what are you doing to the Garrett? This is a... It, that's... It is a Garrett. It is. But it's an inside cylinder? Garrett? What? Why is this thing a thing? Well, if that was that the Garrett design would be helpful for heavier freight trams on curved and steep sections of the line that they were meant to operate on. The L40s they had been using just weren't strong enough anymore, and thus the LTM-51 was meant for those heavy good trams. Trams. Yes, really, this is supposed to be a tram engine! This is the only Garrett design that anyone seems to be aware of that had an inside cylinder at all, and that was supposed to increase steady running at higher speeds and keep the gear away from dust and the general public. Again, it was a tram engine, so having outside cylinders was kind of dangerous. They didn't want to do side skirts or anything, so they just put the cylinder inside. Which, admittedly, in this context does make sense. The water tanks were put below the footplate and outside of the frame, with the coal bunker being in a similar spot that a regular tank engine would have it, right behind where the cab was. This kept the gravity point low and achieved better load distribution over the axles, especially when water was running low itself, which 
you know, is bad, but this helped mitigate that problem too. It also gave a better view for the driver in general. The outside bits of the Garrett design did not have the high tender element. They were flat. You could in fact walk on them. The driver could see very well, and for a tram setup, that was very important because there are many people around. This was meant to move heavy trains on tram lines. And it did. Really. I can't believe it either. Not only is this a weird example of a Garrett, but it's also the last Hanamag locomotive ever built. Due to economic troubles the company was suffering at the time, and it actually carried two builder's numbers. Hanamag's business was transferred to Henschel, but the locomotive was actually built and completed. It entered service in 1931 and performed extremely well. It achieved a significant reduction of coal consumption and ran very steady even at high speeds. But the locomotive's life was quite short, only running for seven years. Why? Well, that wasn't anything to do with it. It was fine. The line it was meant to run on was closed in 1938. With all other assets on the line, the Garrett was sold to Dautremont Scrapyard. It was actually sold again in 1940 to a different Dutch company, and then again in 1941 to Germany, which is sinister at that time, and it disappeared after that, likely scrapped to fuel the German war machine if I had to guess. Friedrich Lungström's final steam turbine locomotives. Steam turbine locomotives? Yeah, those are generally pretty weird in the grand scheme of things. You don't see them very often. But I'm sorry, these are supposed to be success stories. Locomotives that work. We've been over steam turbines before. They're just not efficient. You mean to tell me somebody got them to work? Yes, Frederick Lundström, a Swedish engineer, who had actually had a history trying to work out how to get steam turbines to actually, you know, be functional and usable. He had quite a number of examples built with mixed success. The big issue that he had is that he always wanted to introduce a condensing tender. That does grant higher efficiency by presenting the turbine exhaust with a partial vacuum. But the problem is that a condenser like that, especially back then, greatly added to the complications of the machinery itself. It drove maintenance costs through the roof because you needed specialists to work on it. People just didn't understand how it functioned. Why use something like this when a regular steam locomotive was doing just fine? Well, Lundström didn't want to give up. And in 1932, in conjunction with the... The... There are so many continents there. Sweden, why? N and Home Company. We're gonna go with that. Lundström managed to develop a very successful 280 steam turbine locomotive that was actually based on an existing conventional design for freight traffic on the Grangsberg Oxelsund Railway. The main purpose of that railway was the transportation of iron ore from mines around the area. A distance of 159 miles, 255 kilometers. Due to the distance and weight involved with these kind of trains, the turbines actually flourished in this very specific setting. They proved to be more efficient than their conventional counterparts. They could pull 1,830 tons of a 1 in 100 gradient, and they saved about 10% on fuel. Lungstrom had learned from his previous mistakes and did not give these engines a condenser, which, while technically would have made them more efficient in terms of operation, it would not have in terms of maintenance, so he didn't even bother with it. It just had a forward-mounted turbine and a jack shaft drive. William Stanier actually visited to take a look at the locomotive, and it became the inspiration for the LMS turbomotive, but that's a, another story. Two further examples of the locomotive were built. The class was known as M3T. And despite being built in the early 30s and most turbines not lasting past 10 years, these locomotives lasted until the mid-50s, when the lines they were on were electrified. All three of them wound up in preservation at the Railway Museum at Gragsburg. Their numbers are 71, 72, and 73, and stand as such a unique case. Steam turbines, for the most part, don't usually work out that well historically. They just don't for a variety of reasons. Their efficiency is questionable, especially at low speeds. But due to the purpose that these locomotives were given, and the lines they ran on, and the weight of the trains involved, they absolutely flourished in their setting. So hey, props to Sweden for making steam turbines actually efficient.